My name is Karen Horton, and I'm a plastic surgeon in private practice in San Francisco. Today I'm going to be reviewing Current Trends and Controversies in Breast Augmentation by David Hidalgo and Sammy Sino. This paper included a 35-item questionnaire of breast augmentation practice sent to all active members of the ASPS addressing five areas of interest. Current controversies, new technologies, common practices, technical considerations in secondary procedures, and member demographics. Of the 4,972 members, the response rate was 21%, which was stated as being better than average. The controversies included anatomical implants. Concerns among respondents about their use in order included malrotation risk, increased cost, and lack of proof for aesthetic superiority over other implant types. Autologous fat use as a primary breast augmentation method was also stated to be a controversy. Less than 20% of surgeons responding use this as a primary augmentation method. Reasons stated include the need for many procedures, a limited potential to increase breast size, and cost. Also, the use of preoperative external expansion to increase the likelihood of free fat graft take is recommended. My other concerns with free fat grafting to the breast include the formation of calcifications and oil cysts on mammograms, interference with breast cancer screening, risk of false positives and unnecessary biopsies, or even a delayed breast cancer risk. Interestingly, 7% of respondents had seen a case of ALCL in their practice. Demographics may have played a role in this number because many respondents in practice had been around for at least 25 years. Other controversies included operating on a factor V Leiden heterozygous patient. Whereas everyone said that they would avoid operating on a homozygous patient, 5% of the population carry this heterozygous trait, which has a 3 to 10% increased risk of DVT or deep venous thrombosis. My thoughts are you really need to treat every patient as if they're a potential carrier for the gene, and I tend to use TEDs and SCDs on all of my patients. And also family history of clotting is important. New technologies included 3D imaging. 85% of respondents do not use this technique. Of the users, advantages were stated that it's a marketing tool, it helps in patient education, and it can be used as a sizing aid. My question is, since many respondents perform less than 50 cases a year, are the other busy surgeons who did not respond to the survey using it more? And if so, what is the benefit that they see? The use of acellular dermal matrix, or ADM, was used by 60% of respondents for revision or secondary augmentation. Use of insertion funnels was looked at in detail. 50% of respondents did not use it, but 21% always do. I think they're an interesting gadget, and they were likely invented because of complications. They seem to make most sense for periareolar incision or axillary incisions. The authors state that funnels are more helpful as the implant sizes are larger for a smaller periareolar incision, or that they can help make incisions more normal sized. Personally, I would be interested to hear about the complication rates before and after adoption of the funnel use in insertion funnel uses. The most common practice for sizing involved either the use of round silicone implants or commercial silicone forms in the office or rice bags. Less than 20% of surgeons use tissue-based sizing systems, less than 15% use the 3D sizing, or no system at all. In my practice, I personally use the concept of wish pictures. I get patients to show me pictures of what they're going for, and I have multiple discussions with my patients about their goals. I use intraoperative sizing using an adjustable saline sizer during surgery. I think it would be interesting to find out what other intraoperative sizing methods surgeons are using and how often does the implant selected at the preoperative visit change intraoperatively based on the tissue quality and structure of the breast. Implant type was 82% either mostly silicone or all silicone and mostly smooth surfaced implants. So antibiotic use was performed 94% of the time via intravenous antibiotics at the induction of anesthesia, 56% used postoperative antibiotics, and 84% of surgeons used an irrigation solution using a combination of antibiotics with or without betadine. 61% of respondents use a postoperative massage program, which was quoted as being curiously popular by the authors. Personally, in my practice, I educate patients that their breast implant massage acts as a breast self-exam and it allows them to monitor their breasts and to detect any future problems like capsular contracture or a lump, and I recommend that they continue it every day for as long as they have implants. 
Non-surgical management of capsular contracture. 55% began with massage at the first sign of contracture, and greater than 50% do not recommend any drugs, stating that they are unsure that these medications are helpful, and I'm one of those surgeons. The most common reasons for reoperation include capsular contracture, size change, implant failure, or malposition. The authors did not evaluate other products other than ADM, and I know that there are some new ones out there. The authors surmise that the high reoperation rate for size change might be avoided if sizing methods, methods were more accurate, although they didn't advocate for one specific sizing method over the others. The respondent demographics were recently distributed over intervals of practice time, with a quarter of the respondents in practice greater than 25 years. This was an interesting snapshot of a small subset of ASPS members' current breast augmentation practices, many of whom do not do a great deal of breast augmentation, and I felt that the questions were geared toward the presumptive practice of the authors. Other controversies may be more relevant to practices either with a different patient demographic or elsewhere in the country where things are done differently. Overall, I thought it was a useful paper that allows ASPS members to know what some of our colleagues are doing and reviews current controversies. Thank you.